Dr. Vanessa Sinclair, and this is Rendering Unconscious. My guest today is Chiron Armand, a spirit-initiated shaman holding initiations in such New World traditions as Haitian Budo and Brazilian Kimbanda. He is a trained hoodoo root doctor in the Southern Conjure tradition and is the author of several books, including Deliverance, Hoodoo Spells of Uncrossing, Healing, and Protection, and Clearing Spaces, Inspirational Techniques to Heal Your Home. He holds a master's degree in performance studies from New York University and a bachelor's in ritual anthropology and queer studies from Hampshire College. For more, please visit his websites, impactshamanism.com, and allsouldameanote.com and follow him on social media. Links to everything can be found in the text accompanying this episode. This episode is also available to view on YouTube as are most Rendering Unconscious podcast episodes. Just search for Rendering Unconscious podcast at YouTube or search for Trapart Films YouTube channel. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T Film at YouTube. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry. Available from Trapart Books, 2019. Please visit our publisher's website, www.trapart.net You can support the podcast by visiting our Patreon p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash v-a-n-e-s-s-a two three c-a-r-l Your support is greatly appreciated. All right, so here I am. I'm in. uh, I'm currently in Campinas, Brazil. I came to Brazil a year ago for what was going to be just a two-week trip. I had moved to Guatemala the August before. And I have an apartment there that I'm still paying for. Um, and I've been wanting to get back to, but I came here for a two week trip uh, because I was going to study with a teacher in Kimbanda, Nicolás de Mantos Pujol. And uh, the, the workshop was, was really amazing. And it was great because some of the, um, some of the ways in which Kimbanda has been translated into a United States paradigm. There's some stuff going on. There's some stuff going on. And I wanted to put my feet on the ground, on, on, in the homeland of the tradition, and, and frankly study with my teacher's teacher. And um, I, what ended up happening was right after the workshop, I ended up getting very sick. I was in the hospital for a month with pneumonia, and when I got out, it was like walking dead because COVID. And I couldn't even get back to Guatemala. And I just had, so happened to uh, have met uh, my fiance, who I was with, you know, the like the first who I met the first night I arrived in Sao Paulo, we call these karmic relationships, um, and they usually don't work out. Um, <laughs> uh, this is working out, thank God, and um, this is working out. And um, yeah, I, I've been here in, in Sao Paulo, uh, in, in the Sao Paulo, the state of Sao Paulo, ever since. Uh, I can go back to Guatemala now, but now uh, my boyfriend is working on his uh, sort of Brazilian form of GED. I have some additional initiations happening soon in, in Kimbanda and Ipa, so I've been here ever since. How cool. And Nick, who you're studying with, he's a psychologist originally as well. He is. So he is. He pulled, he pulled some shit on me. <laughs> he pulled some psychologist shit on me like a few weeks ago because I came to him with some really heavy stuff and he was like, was like doing some shit and was like my mind was like, what are you doing nigga and then I was and then he was like 
I just need to make sure that you weren't schizophrenic based on what you're telling me, and you're not. And wow, that's the really heavy spiritual stuff you're bringing. And I'm like, welcome to Chiron. Like, um, <laughs> so yeah, that was a that was a, a strong reminder that we had the tools to be able to make sure that what I was bringing was real other world experiences and not um, sort of split self hanging on scaffolding for identity stuff. Whatever you psychologists say. Because psychologists <laughs> say different things. And that's what we're trying to do is like depathologize experiences that are human experiences that people need to understand better instead of just putting in a category and trying to hide away and not dealing with. Because people can work through these experiences, use them, harness them, and like change their lives or help other people change their lives after having gone through certain things. For sure, for sure. Um, psychology is, is fascinating to me um, because it's it's so young, it's so young as a as a field, and it is trying to do something that many other fields, in a, whether you know, in an indigenous or traditional culture sense, were trying to address. Um, be that the role of the shaman or and or medicine person and or herbalist and or um you know ritualist or or lore keeper this is how you know we know that if we all do this ritual annually we all grieve and now there is more heart space we're not usually thinking about that we're not we're, we're just saying like this old thing they did but but there were so many roles that were at, in play to help maintain and and support the psyche of the individual um, while also recognizing and asserting the role of the individual in the collective. Um, and so there's, so psych, say, in my view, psychology is trying to have like a whole host of fields at once and also trying to catch up with ways that we were kind of naturally being with together. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. And I think that's something that's really people have lost sight of is like the individual in the collective because of course it also helps it helps the individual but it's also helping the collective stay healthy which is i mean and, and then that brings in the problem because we have been i think um bamboozled as to what the collective is it even is i mean at this point we just say oh the collective it's a dog eat dog world or the rat race and it's just like this was never the intention of the collective um you know it, you're not going to find a tree being like, oh, the rat race, that mulberry shrub, you know, fuck me over. Like, like that's not happening. <laughs> like, there's a, everything in nature is, we find an efficiency and a beauty in the biodiversity together, except us. Um, one of the things that one of my old shamanic teachers said that was hugely important for me was what you're dealing with when you're dealing with, um, not meeting your potential or uh, dealing with the lack of um, clear and full expression of your soul purpose in the world, what you're dealing with is the failure of the culture. Culture has a role, culture has a purpose. Yeah, the purpose of the culture is to support its person because the person is bring back into the culture. So there's a gap, there is a, there's a, there's a distance, there's something missing here. And as I have been, um, Probably stating in most recent, you know, interviews and podcasts, there's an agenda. Sorry, this doesn't happen out of nowhere. There's no way that something like we we just forgot. We just forgot how to like survive together. No, there's there's something wrong, and it's an agenda, and or uh, a planet that is an organism that we are a part of. That agenda isn't from. Here. That'd be like my, me telling my cells, fuck Kai, and they just go, oh, fuck Kai, and they just turn inside out. And then like, you know what I'm saying? Like, there's, like, there's nothing here that would support us losing our fucking minds in the way that we have. And yeah. Yeah, no, and when, when he who shall not be named was about to be elected, you're, you're the person that said to me, you were like, well, what did everybody think was going to happen? Because everybody was like, oh my God, how could this happen? And you were like, of course this is happening. I'm like, 
I guess, did you think this is going to go on forever? You're just going to have endless progress and all this money from like stealing people's land and then stealing other people from their land and putting them here. It's like, no, this is not going to work out for y'all. Like, have you seen a river flow? Have you turned on a faucet? This is how you like, energy moves in this way. And, and that which is underneath is going to come up to the surface. Yeah, exactly. It had to. It's about time. Yeah, like my mom being a lesbian. About time, which you could come out the fucking closet. Nice, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> um, should we talk about the conference? Because when we had the first psychoanalysis art in a cold conference, it specifically you actually opened it. Well, Caitlin opened it with a um prayer to the spirits of the land, but then you actually opened the conference and then partook in the closing ritual of the conference as well. I mean, I let's can we start with the fact that I never ever thought I'd be an Anglophile. And God, I love London. It was my second time back in London. The first time was weirdness. It's usually weirdness that leads me places, or at least has been in this lifetime. So it was great to be in London and to be in such a collegiate atmosphere. Um, <laughs> it reasserted the fact that all I actually want to do is just do like conferences and retreats and wild things around the world with artists and visionaries and get drunk and dance on tables at night. That's what life is really about, frankly. Um, the conference was great, you know. Um, it was it was great to be able to to present. Um, it was great to. I love links. I love links between persons and ideas and uh, fields and. Um, I also love sexy things, sexy things in terms of like aesthetically. Like I remember that um, um, Scarlet Imprint publishers were there and their, their work is just utterly sexy and, and very inspiring when it comes to the publishing world. Um, I, uh, I remember the, the morning of the conference and then, you know, this is me going into like a, you know, my field, I'm coming at this work from an especially, you know, shamanic perspective. Uh, you know, that's the field I'm, I'm, I'm primarily bringing, even though I have a background in performance and from NYU. Um, but I remember the morning thereof, I, I suddenly felt like a very thick mustache, like rubbing against my face. But it wasn't a physical mustache; it was just a our spirit. Like, I was like, "Why do I feel this?" And I looked, and I'm just like, "What's going on?" And I was like, "Why think Gillian is here?" And I think he's asking, "What the fuck is going on? Why are you guys?" coming together in my name, you know, in the occult. And even though I was, um, you know, in a flat, <laughs> at a flat with, you know, a number of other, you know, occultists specifically um, who were attending the conference, we all come at intuition and psychism and mediumship from different angles and perspectives. So I did not expect that I would walk into the room and be like, hey guys, Young is here. And people would be like, oh yeah, Young. Like I expected, you know, like a, well, you know, maybe that's the case. You might have to light a candle and do a nine day elevator. Who knows if we all have our different processes. Mine is a little bit more um, wild, yet I have my structures and there's, there's um, you know, methods to my madness. Um, but what I, what I did express because it was so fascinating to me and I knew that everyone was finishing up their, their, their papers and presentations. And I was like, I can't hold back that. I think the guy who are writing about this here, I think he's confused. <laughs> and I, so I remember going into the kitchen. I was like, hey guys, I think was, And what happened actually was that one by one, each person started just like, uh, like when you, like when you like say the word, like one word, and then the person says the next word and you develop a story. Each person started picking up a different aspect of why he was here and what was unresolved with him. And, and at some point, oh, and then his dogs, there was something about his dogs being present as well. And then someone mentioned um, Freud, and then we all just felt the pain of the, that, of the loss of friendship in the sense of betrayal. And, um, and it, it, this experience did not last more than five minutes, but it was so distinct in my mind because we had about four or five, you know, different practitioners, all, you know, some of them similar traditions, but all of them different life backgrounds. And each of them was whether or not they were able to fully say they were having this experience or whether or not they sort of just intuitively added something or unconsciously added something, we all filled in the gaps. And it was for me such an affirmation of this just happened. This just happened and we're here. And the work that we're doing is not just academic, it is shamanic in the sense of we are working with the ancestors of these academic fields. 
Or I love that. The great ancestor, one of the great ancestors of psychology and, and is here. No, I love that because that's one of the reasons I wanted to have the conference is because that split with Freud and Jung is like continued in the field. There's like, it's still split. And like, it's okay to talk about occult things, quote unquote, if you're a Jungian, but like the Freudian side, it's like, no way. But Freud was interested in it too throughout his entire life. So it's such a shame that it's the field still split from this, you know, falling out that these two guys had a hundred years ago. <laughs> and for me, that asserts something that, <coughs> has been interesting for me. The reason why it was important to Freud, but Freud was able to um, play respectability politics in his psychology was he had the choice to, he had the privilege. And that brings in a conversation, and this is a conversation that uh, a lot of people don't want to have anywhere. Um, and, you know, even in the spiritual world, even in the worlds of shamanism, however one might define that, even, you know, or, or psychism, what do you mean by privilege? Well, every traditional culture does speak to a conversation that certain persons might be grabbed up. Your ass is grabbed up and you don't get choice when it comes to certain overwhelming uh, near death initiatory experiences by the spirit world. And that makes people um, a number of things, especially in American culture, it makes people angry because it fucks with their sense of uh, choice and agent and human agency. It, it, oh, it asserts, even for, for pagans and, and, and spirit workers, it asserts an agency of the spirit world that they, that, does, that, that is far bigger than people want to come to grips with. And also it brings up identity issues because we are so severely struggling with identity in our Western culture. Well, why not me? And it's like, you don't, you don't want this. And, and, and Jung is someone who, as far as I'm concerned, is one of the first contemporary Western shaman type of persons in the contemporary Western world. And it was so completely at odds with his being a white raced uh, because no one's white, he was white raced. It was something that was done. Whiteness is a thing that was done to him. It was a thing that was a, it was a um, something that was wrapped up in him. And, and um, but as a white raced man of a certain class, that kind of loss of agency in the face of that which was not even believed to exist, I'm sure, was extremely traumatizing for him. And, I believe it's why when he did show up in that um, hotel room, in that flat, <laughs> when the morning of the conference, it was very obvious to me that he had not crossed over because he had already suffered so much with the unknown and unknown in the face of, I imagine, proper, proper you know, white race Swiss folks that now he's dead, whoever, you know, whatever psychopunk spirit came and said, all right, Time to cross over, Carl. He was like, no, fuck you. There's no way I'm going with you anymore. Like, I'm not taking anyone's hand again to go anywhere. And, and, I, and I understood that, Trump. I understood, like, wow, like, he, he went through the fucking ringer and, and he has held back going again. Yeah, and something interesting that I just put together recently was because him and Freud split in, like, 1913, 1914. And then... Um, he started the red book like right after like in 1915 so he started like really diving into um or that or, or that process process i don't know if it started before they split or was starting when they split but sometimes right around their split is when the whole process really started for him or he really like went into it full force so that's interesting as well that his like father figure or whatever and his friendship kind of split and then he was kind of on his own well, it's interesting that you also say father figure because that brings into question, you know, um, th there are stages, there are, there are supposed to be stages to human development. You know, one really should not be overwhelmingly initiated into one's calling before initiation into adulthood. So, you know, if, if, if Freud was sort of standing or, or, or positioned between 
Jung and the divine as dad slash God, because dad and mom are God. Until we are initiated into adulthood, until that child emotional body is no longer exists, and mom and dad are no longer gods, now they are just the, the culture members who help foster you, but now it's sky and earth that are God, uh, mom and dad are God. So in some way, you know, Freud was, was positioned between him and the divine. So Freud needed to, to be pulled out of the equation for Jung to have full fucking access to everything that he ended up having access to. That makes sense. Will you talk a little bit about that for people, for people who aren't familiar with these kinds of different stages of initiation into adulthood and that sort of thing? Well, I'll start by saying I don't know everything. And sometimes I feel like I might not know anything. And I love not finding out that I didn't know something. So this is, today is what, uh, February 28th, 2021. Awesome. This is what Kai thinks today. Um, as far as I'm concerned, and the way that I was taught by one of my, you know, one of my old, old teachers was, um, you know, there are gates, there are portals. Um, and we move through them, or we're supposed to move through them. Um, and these gates are related to, um, frankly, birth, adulthood, and, and death. And there are kind of other initiations in there as well, when one experiences a divorce, a death in the family, um, loss of sense of place in the world, spirit initiation, sometimes a craft, literally the, the spirit of the violin might come and get that ass. And next thing you know, you're having a dream and you, and you need to, you know, and, and 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 because this you know and perhaps it's being backed up by 30 ancestors who who crafted violins over the past 400 years and it's really your calling and, and we are not living in any way in a culture that supports us recognizing moving through or completing any of these stages that are vital and happen to humans and that all what further support the human being in contributing to the culture because you're told that contributing to the culture, yes, go get a job. Mm, the perversity, there's something wrong and um, we can smell it. It smells wrong, only we live in it so fully. So we just say, oh, that's just life, but it's so not the life, it's so anti-life. Um, so when we talk about, you know, tending the gates of birth, we're talking about um, someone is born and they're, <laughs> There's a gate, there's a gate. We see it in the, the person who has given birth to this child. There's some gate that this being has passed through and that gate needs to be tended to. Literally the person who has given birth needs to be tended to energetically and emotionally and physically and spiritually. And the person who has just come through this gate, a cord needs to be cut to the other world. We know that part. Um, but other things need to be done as well to help cleanse and, and support this, this child being and and also protect them in their coming so now we just you know we're talking about certain things when it comes to tending the gates of birth i don't know a whole lot about um tending the gates of birth um i but i can think to um you know certain cultures might wrap a child very tightly in like swaddling blankets like to help protect this is a fragile being and their soul is kind of loosely attached to their body so we don't want the soul to fly off you know they're especially vulnerable to trauma and harmful spirits we want to wrap the child up to keep that soul and that child safe and strong together uh, i think about uh Cuban hair, you know, in, in Cuban culture, they might not use the term, um, folks might not use the term tending the gates of birth, but like if you're, uh, you know, uh, uh, especially a Cuban girl, like you're gonna get your ears pierced and you're gonna have azabachi, you know, earrings and for protection and keeping away the evil eye. And um, I believe that both, I, I know that this is in like certain um, North Asian cultures, perhaps in Cuban culture as well, but like, you know, one of the ways that the community helps tend the gate of birth is, you know, oh, what a beautiful baby. No, your mouth is full of the evil eye. Like you're trying to steal my baby's beauty and youth. You say, that is a child. <laughs> like, 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 like what a human child you have. <laughs> like you sort of like, <laughs> curb your adjectives so as to not, um, you know, take away from, from this very vulnerable beings, you know, process. Uh, the gate of adulthood, you know, we as children are um, liars. <laughs> We're just, yes, fucking liars. Um, we are doing everything we can to make sure that those that feed us and house us don't kill us. So anything that makes us feel like 
these gods will love us and allow and support our surviving, we're doing. And this means a lot of mass creation, a lot of, you know, a lot of mass creation in the face of scraping one's knee, perhaps making dad mad, no dad's gonna kill me, soul loss, like the bunch of shit that's happening. And at a certain point, none of that shit matters anymore because you can start feeding your fucking self and you can start surviving in the world on your own. And the approval and uh, resources of these beings actually doesn't matter anymore. So what happens with the psyche and the soul and the emotion, all that shit you built needs to go. And we don't do that in our culture. So here we are, chronological adults, still trying to get our childhood needs met. But she won't like me, but, he won't, but who gives a fuck? You can eat food. You know how to feed yourself. Who gives a flying fuck who doesn't like you or what doesn't or what you're afraid of? Nothing matters. None of that matters. This is all emotional. Sorry, I'm like in this cafe, like, who gives a fuck? Like, but like, I don't even think we can speak every English. <laughs> I love it. But, I love it. <laughs> but, like, you know, it's a question of like, it's, it's, now, now, now there's a gap. Now we are chronological adults still trying to avoid annihilation and abandonment when these aren't even real possibilities in that way anymore. And all of our emotional processes are based around these things. What a waste, what a waste. What a waste of human energy and potential. Uh, I'm not saying waste like waste, but waste like we could all be doing so much better and feel so much safer. We could all feel so much safer and, and, and all be projecting 100% less <laughs> onto each other. Um, and then there's the gate of death. I mean, then there's the gates of initiation, you know? Um, I myself am someone who was absconded with by the spirit world uh, about eight years back and started having some experiences that I could not really name. And, but only because I had read essays written by other spirit initiated persons. And I knew people who knew people who knew spirit initiated people. I was able to say, okay, there's some kind of a, a shaman sickness or shamanic initiation process happening um, that's outside of the scope of my very excellent magical teachers and, and, and mediumship teachers. It's outside of their scope. And I have to learn some other tools, not only for um, like pretty much for, for surviving and, and getting to the other side as, as quickly as possible with the new forces that were in my life because it was for me um, life or death in a mental emotional sense uh, and I did end up having some life or death other you know parts that were more physical but um, I had to make it to the other side and this was not something that I I should have had to do as alone as I had I'm so glad I'm here because I had support but in a traditional culture, it would have been recognized and the support would have been unquestioned. It would have been there by the entire community. Um, and then there's the gate of death. There is the fact that when you die, you are doing the reverse part. Uh, you're going back into mom and, and that has to happen in a good way. It has to happen fully. It has to happen completely. Who you have been, what you have left behind needs to be fully and we have to recognize it, meet it, deal with it, celebrate it, mourn it, support your crossing over so that you don't hang around here like stanky ass cheese. And not stanky cheese that's like really good, but like that stanky cheese that's like bad. Like, wow, this is really stanky. Like, this is taking up the whole refrigerator. And I don't even know what the other stuff smells like. Like, and, and that's what happens, frankly, with unresolved dead people. We are, we as the living are overwhelmed by something that is still here that should not be and it is crowding out our expression. And those unresolved dead folks do tend to especially gravitate towards persons in their ancestral line who might be able to, um, who might resonate with them or places that they frequented. You know, we, we turn this into a lifetime original mystery thing. Like, oh, I have to help this person solve this. Oh, stop fucking working with unresolved dead people. Cross that ass over and get back to being a live human being. Um, so, you know, these are the gates that I'm thinking about, uh, as well as the gates of, you know, sometimes life throws you a curveball, and the answer isn't 
call your boss and beg to take three days off to deal with that thing that came up? The answer is we all recognize and we step back and we give you the space and the time because whatever you're going through, your ability to go through it fully and, and support it and come out the other side will be medicine for, for all of us on the other side. So why would we work that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's such a much better way of looking at it. The, the current system is so inhumane. It's just so inhumane. Entirely inhumane. Will you talk a little bit more about shaman sickness for people who don't know? Sure. So um, I uh, I was, I, when I say I was taught, I mean, what I, the reading that I've done and, and the folks that I've run into, <coughs> there, there tends to be a, a, a madness road and a... Um, and a physical illness road. And I, I've been given thick, uh, thick slices of the madness road. Uh, and, and, it, and it's not something that's going to ever really end, you know, for the rest of my life, I will go through short bouts of madness. And what, I, what that madness looks like for me is things might be especially intense for me, emotionally, mentally, things might be especially vibrational. Um, a few days ago, I had like a day, I was going, you know, I was doing some major energetic cleanup work on myself. I had a dream and I just knew, okay, Kai, you're about to have madness day. And uh, I was able to go to the store and buy things and, you know, seem normal. But I also knew that like, I could probably speak a little bit faster and a little bit more intensely than usual. Um, I knew that like, I might need a little bit of emotional or energetic outlet. I might have to like, I don't know, flash someone my tummy or like, just like do something silly, like, like this, this something silly to, to move the energy that was happening. Um, and I, you know, I, I wrapped my head in white. I, you know, I tried to stay cool. I tried to stay calm. Just like eat a cheeseburger, chips, watch Dirty Rock. Um, it, was, it was one of my madness days. But you know, I, I've had, I've had weeks of that kind of experience and months. And sometimes they have been uh, ultra um, infiltrated by, by by strong visions from spirits and and information from spirits or or the knowledge that I am being changed. The whole thing, you know, about a um, the initiatory process, be it any of these initiatory processes, is it's you're going to change, and it is you're supposed to change. That's how that's how this works, and change is scary, and that's why you need support, and you also need elders, and you need to see, but you get to become that. That's why this is worth it. And um, so yeah, so so shaman sickness uh, uh, or shaman type of person initiatory experiences um, will often involve experiences of being you know, dismembered, uh, either in waking life or in dream life. Um, parts of you taken out, other parts being put in. Um, for me, there's a lot of questions, as, you know, in our, in our culture as Americans and contemporary Westerners, a lot of questions about who gets to call themselves a shaman. And some folks will say, you know, it's never a human being, it is a community. And there is legitimacy in that. It's the, it's a human, it's the community that says that someone's a shaman, but there's a lot of communities that say that people are shamans in our culture and the person does not, for me, cut the cloth for me. Some of the defining elements of being a shaman kind of person, a word that anthropologists have thoroughly misused and applied to a variety of cultures, even though it's coming out of a very specific culture in um, North Asia, is I think what it serves us to move forward with and recognize is when someone is going through a spirit-induced near-death experience that is um, being, being, being guided by a specific singular recognizable spirit who is, yes, I am the one who is killing you to make you an energetic being that on the other side of this, you will be a conduit between the spirit world and myself in a way that you could not have been just as a human being. I'm killing you to remake you energetically. That's why the dismemberment. And um, if you survive this, you will be this conduit and you will have a special relationship with me. And, um, and also you will be, frankly, more something else than you are human. 
That's the other part of shamanism. Um, sh shaman kind of person and initiates a very experience that at the end of it, the person who has been, the human has been made it is no longer exactly human. Yeah, it's so important, like for people to be educated about these things. And like you said, for there to be support more societally, because when something like this might be happening to someone, I'm sure it's, it's really scary. And it would be nice to feel held and understood by the community instead of like pathologized and kind of othered. A hundred percent. I, um, I'll never forget, you know, my, my, my shaman, uh, shamanic initiatory process, as is extremely common, shaman and shamanic initiatory process usually involves um, something related to gender, because gender is about power. Gender is about the stories about power that you have been told you are allowed to wield and the sort of power that you've been told you're not allowed to wield or have. Um, and if we're stretching your sense of beingness beyond human, well, whatever boxes you also have playing out in the human category you need to be pretty much obliterated as well because you're, you're going to need to wield energetic resources from a variety of spheres. And this shit can't either be blocked by these stories um, or, or, or get hooked on them. Yeah, I remember in my own um, kind of like seven year, year process, I remember um, I was dealing with some very uh, annoying spirit stuff that was happening and I was lighting candles, trying to get rid of them. And I remember I was working with a, a shaman who was able to say, you're lighting candles, but you don't realize that this entity is fire related. You're just feeding it. And what it brought up was um, how out of right relationship I was with the element of water. And woo, water, like fluidity. No, thank you. I'm fucking, you know, like I'm a, as far as I understood, like I'm a cisgendered black dude from Queens. Like, don't come at me with no fluidity. I got my Tims. Like, like you know, walking hard in the streets and, and, uh, I had to, 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 I was, you know, my, my, my shaman was able to remove this energy, but in order to curb my vulnerability, I had to step into a right relationship with the element of water. So what I did was I, I, you know, I, by that time I had already had training in working with the elements, devotional practice, and I just had a bowl of water and every day I would pour water onto water and I would sing to water and I would dance water and I would just feel my hips unlock and the terror, no, I mean, the amount of times it's called a faggot beating up on, you know, beating up at the playground, PS 106, like, you know, all the ways I had blocked my access to what I thought was femininity, but really it was beauty. Really it was beauty, really it was ease and flow of being all the ways in which my, my masculine and, and black race body had become rigid and, and uncompromising in the face of dad, in the face of homophobia and transphobia, in the face of, you know, racism and, and, and to feel it melt away and to find, oh wow, this isn't that bad. Oh wow, this is actually safer. Oh wow, this is free. Um, gender always comes into process as a part of shamanic initiatory process um, because if you're going to, and, and frankly, it should be a part of everyone's process. Um, you know, there are so many traditional cultures. I, I look at trans folks and I say trans folks are actually doing what everyone's supposed to be doing. Like what, you're a man because someone told you were? That's boring. <laughs> like that's boring as fuck. I'm a man because I have, because I have cultivated my, my, my masculinity and my manhood and I know what manhood is for me and I know what it means to me. And also because I have been driven so far away from my birthright as a man by intrusive spirits, by other things that got into my shamanic initiation because it wasn't tended well by community. And at the, the point where it looked like it was so far gone and I was so far away from myself, some part of me still remembered who I was and I was able to crawl on fucking elbows and knees back to retrieve myself. I, I, my, my manhood is, is not a given to me. It is an, it is an, un, it is an unassailability um, because I, I, I claimed it and I fought for it and I, and I came back to it again and again, not because someone told me to, but because it was the beacon that was saying, come home for me. And if you don't have a beacon that's saying, come home for you, if you're just sitting somewhere because someone said, sit there, 
anyone can lift your ass up and, and, and relocate you. No, that's such a beautiful point. And um, no, because we are fluid. And like you said, it's just like, like if, in Freud and psychoanalysis, he talks about like, we're all born bisexual. I think now he would just say we're just all born sexual. And then these kinds of stories and narratives are kind of carved out in our lifetime where we get like more and more rigidly stuck into uh, certain points of identities or perspectives based on, you know, what society is telling us, but that's not how we start out. Which is why also in, in traditional cultures, there's the idea that like, um, and I, and I keep saying many traditional cultures, this is why I need to get back to academia so that I can back up my, back up my ideas <laughs> because I know things I'm like, I remember, I remember from books I read long before all of this happened to me. But I, I, I remember like at, at least one tribe in the United States, let's get more specific than that. I don't want to be certain people I don't like. Um, at least one tribe in the United States, like there's like a, a term that just means child and everyone just has that term child until like you're like 12 or 13 and you started to show certain energetic characteristics. And now, okay, now we know that you're not just child, you are one of 17 different genders, each of which has its own dialect. Whoa, so much space for being. And also for gender changing later on as well. Mm -hmm. um, there are stories of, you know, I think there's a story of a, taking a specific here, I'm pretty sure this is an Inuit shamanic culture, um, and there was a, a woman who had a husband and her husband died and her husband was a, um, and upon her husband dying, somewhere after that she received a dream and the dream was telling her, okay, it is time for you to be living a more masculine of center role that's also coming with certain shamanic medicinal gifts that you're supposed to be carrying. And it was just like, okay. And this woman was like older in age. But, but being human, as you said, is about a fluidity because who needs to be the, the um, mother and father pair and the father dies and the mother has to expand perhaps into holding a greater, you know, father-like space. We're here to be together. <laughs> Roots of trees reach out to each other and support. What do we think we're doing here? That's a good question. <laughs> What do we think we're doing here? <laughs> <laughs> like the, the adaptability, everything in nature does it. Absolutely. So what are you doing now, Kai? What's impact um, shamanism doing? Impact shamanism is um, no longer schedulable in terms of sessions. Certain folks, you know, some folks that reach out to me manually um, and just say, hey, I, I think I would really like the session. And based on what their experiences they're having, based on if I do feel like I could be of help, uh, we might be able to schedule something, but I'm kind of toning things down there just because I'm a little burnt out from the past uh, year, especially Brazil, hit me with that one, two gut punch. Like it's been rough, <laughs> it's, been, it's been rough, but shit I've had to learn uh, and move through. Um, so I'm, I think what, what I'm planning to do already is this year, I'm especially interested in teaching. Um, you know, I, I'm bringing to, to four, um, you know, uh, many years uh, with a background in folk magic and um, uh, trance work and spirit work, you know, working with, you know, deities and, and ancestors and, um, you know, if you name it, I got it. <laughs> like I've had, to, I've had to, to navigate working with a lot of different kinds of energies as a contemporary human being, you know, American human being. And I find what I've done really fascinating. I'm surprised I'm alive. And I am thrilled about the idea of care, you know, of being able to share. I love to teach. I love to share what I've learned with others. And I'd love to see where people go. Like um, as much as I enjoy doing uh, shamanic consultations and divination sessions for people, I fucking love coaching. Oh my God. Like I'll just give you a couple of prompts and I'll just sit here as you're doing the trance work. And that shit just gets me fucking off. That's just beautiful to me because we all, if there's anything that my work or my process has done, it's shown me, damn, we all have incredible fucking capacities. And, and what's standing in the way of using them is like the stupid shit we all believe. Oh, so sad because of the awe, the mystery, the missions available to each of us are being mind blowing. So uh, what I'm doing now is I am uh, preparing to um, teach some courses throughout the uh, year. Um, but because I'm also here in Brazil, uh, where I have access to, frankly, um, statuary 
and uh, art pieces uh, that we don't have access to in the States. Uh, I've been waiting for, you know, I, I, as, a part, as a Kim Bandero, I've been waiting to be here for seven years so that I could have the traditional statuary associated with the tradition. Uh, I just opened osolbemanochi.com where I will be um, selling uh, statues that I am able to find here in the, here throughout the country associated with different issues and pombajeras and I'll be selling them uh, as is, but I will, because I also have the license to, I, for folks who would like an empowered or cross statue, one that has actually been gone through a consecrated process to that spirit, um, those will also be on the site. And I'm also looking forward to being able to um, blog about my experience specifically in this tradition. There's a, it's, you know, I, I bring a lot of stuff together and I, I don't, I haven't gotten to really share my journey with a specific energetic lineage. And this will also enable me to bring some of my academic ethics to the fore in terms of anthropology. What does it mean for me to be a guest in a culture that is not my own and in their tradition? And how do I navigate idea that I think I know, but that I don't know? For instance, cats here have seven lives, not nine. Mm. That's crazy shit. You don't want that shit to trip you up. You don't want to like offend them. like they're going to happen around that. But like, how can I both, how can I be a bridge between where I have been given the privilege to travel and where is home for me and do so in a way that also gives back to where I am now. So it's going to be a fun exploration. That's kind of like my next foray. That's wonderful. And I will be talking to you about those statues. Gladly, gladly. These they're so beautiful, and uh, every time I walk into a shop, I'm like, with my heart sings. These, these spirits are incredible. My, my boyfriend has a background in Umbanda, so I've, I've I've learned about other spirits in the traditions here, and I didn't know about before too. I've seen folks on the streets like, I think this other spirit from Umbanda was kind of following me the other day. Um, you know, certain like Zays. It's not just Zay Palincha, but there are other Zays in Umbanda. It's been fascinating. Um, I, I'm as wild of a ride, as wild of a ride as I've had on this earth, I have been extremely privileged to have such a visceral experience of places and beings. And should we talk a little bit about what Kimbanda is for people who might not know? Sure, that's my, that's my greatest fear. I'm like, how do I get tongue tied when I think about talking about it? I think especially because there are persons who have spoken about it so powerfully. Uh, I'm just gonna borrow, you know, I'll, I'll start by borrowing the words of uh, Nicolas de Montes Griswold's book. Um, uh, one of his books is uh, Eshu, you know, and it's, he has Eshu, he has Pompejita, and one of the first words I use when I'm trying to describe Kimbanda is night and fire. Because generally, if you're doing work in Kimbanda, there's, you're doing it at night, actual work. The spirits actually work during the day as well. They are active, during, but they are most active. You're doing work at night, and there's some fucking fire involved. Um, the best way that I would describe my experience of the tradition, if I were to put a definition to it, would be this is a tradition that is especially that is populated by masculine spirits called Eshus and uh, more feminine spirits that are speaking to the, the archetypal woman in the cosmos, Hombajiras. And these are spirits that are serpentine. Legions of dead that are especially tied to the shadow aspects, to the to the infernal aspects of us as human beings, while themselves being both um, chthonic and very frankly very cosmic. And I did not really realize how cosmic they were until I was working through some cosmic shit this past year. And I thought, oh wow, I did not know you guys could do that. I did not know you could help me with the draconians. <laughs> um, but, but you were able to. Uh, and so, so each person has eshus and pombajitas. Uh, this, just, just knowing who your eshus and pombajitas are is tradition is especially medicinal because this helps you to understand something about your energetic makeup in the world. Um, you, these, these eshus are located at. In kingdoms, there are seven kingdoms in King Banda, the kingdom of the beach, the kingdom of the woods, um, the kingdom of Lyra. I am especially connected to the kingdom of Lyra, as well as, which is related to uh, music and, and, and theater and performance. We have kingdoms and we have lines, and these lines are actually speaking to the 
cultural lineages that have moved through the landscape of Brazil. Brazil is so fucking diverse. And it was actually uh, mind-blowing to me because the mirror that we get in the States is so um, distorted. And, you know, it, it, it plays out um, our Latin American fraternalism, you know, um, that we've been playing with in all of Latin America. But Brazil is extremely diverse um, with, with um, Roma, uh, Roma heritages and, and uh, Western and Eastern European heritages, uh, different aspects of different countries and tribes of Africa are, are still energetically recognized in these lines in Kimbanda and Golan and Kwan, uh, North African Malay lines. Um, and these also get expressed, these bubble up into the form of these Eshus and Pomogedas who might be walking um, in a particular line while being from a particular kingdom. And if that is what is walking with you, it's saying something about you. We are lacking identity in our culture as Americans. Being able to understand like, okay, well, I know my issue is issue Gerere, world traveler, uh, international sorcerer. I can kind of say, well, you know what? Maybe I will book that trip to Hawaii. Maybe that is a part of me. Maybe I can loosen up and be more of myself. If I know that my Pombajira is Pombajira Hyena Sechin Gelatus maybe I need to really own my power more and realize, wow, my Pombajira is a fucking queen. Okay, maybe I deserve more than I've been giving myself. Maybe also part of my work is to really support other women in stepping into their power because as a queen, I am especially gifted at uplifting their women. And you know, this is this is bare bones perspective just on the um to borrow a term, psychology of how these spirits can be worked with or seen as archetypal mirrors of oneself. But then there's of course uh the actual working with these spirits as teaching spirits that are that love you and guide you and reflect some heavy fucking shit about you and are happy to help you evolve just as they have evolved in their own processes as that. Yeah, and justice. I love that. You have an experience of the tradition. Can I do that justice? <laughs> Absolutely. And I, I think that was wonderful. And I think that it's, um, it's amazing to me. I love that it's like legions of dead. Like you said, it's like there are certain kind of archetypes, for lack of a better word, of, of like a lineage of like a similar kind of person in their life. And they've all kind of come together into this like being of this certain Pompagira in death. And so it's like this really powerful lineage, like throughout time from life to death, and then still guiding the living um, kind of from the other side. And I think it's really amazing. And we have so much support here. It doesn't make any sense that we are so unsupported. Like we have so much support here. And you know, this is a tradition that's especially, you know, coming out of, you know, Brazilians' own relationship to slavery and colonialism and, and you know, African um, traditions intersecting with European traditions um, and, and, and indigenous traditions to, to make this this beautifully unique um, tradition, and it, 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 it's, it's so fucking close to my heart. I, I, I'm so privileged to have such a, again, a visceral experience of the land and and know these spirits in their in their in their soul. Mm, yeah, that's amazing. And I think that's something important that we should mention too, is that like, like when we put together this conference in psychoanalysis and art and the occult, you know, a lot of people think of like, oh, the occult is like new agey or like, you know, kind of pop magic and that sort of thing. And that's all fine and well and good and whatever. But really, like the people that I invited, it's like shamans, kimbanda tata, santeros, voodoo priests, you know, people from traditions that, you know, mainstream Western psychology, American psychology pathologizes. And it's really racist, <laughs> basically. Yeah, it's really yeah, racist. Yeah, yeah. A lot of it come, come, just comes down to that, frankly. Mm -hmm. uh, it's amazing how many, like the, the amount of like code words and codes that just like that are between actually isn't just racist. <laughs> um, and uh, and when I think about racism, I, 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 I think about like losses that we all take in the face of perverse perspectives of each other. Um, you know, some of us are, some of us, you know, are historically looted, but the loss is everyone's. 
us when we have these, you know, really distorted and perverted perspectives. Absolutely. And I feel like for academics specifically, um, you know, academia understands now the problems of colonialism and the discrepancies it's caused with poverty and like all of these problems worldwide. But when it comes to like magical practices, there's still this like huge bias They're like, oh, you're getting into that stuff, you know, and it's like, you guys, this stems from this, this stems from the same issue. But I'm always, I'm always thinking about like, the divide, the divide has to do with belief in the non-physical reality, ability to affect physical reality. Um, I'm always thinking about these things because I mean, I I kind of want to bring my attention to where you are um, kind of like frustrated <laughs> like, or like, I, I like, I, I, I want to, and I, and I maybe, maybe, you know, it's not going to take words to heal it. Wow, that's helpful. So I, I just saved myself five years. <laughs> it's not going to take words to heal it. It's going to take experiences. It's going to take, profound experiences and frankly we're all I believe entitled to profound experiences with non reality. I think it's a part of the human. You know. mm -hmm. Absolutely. What's yeah. next for you? Uh -huh. Well I'll tell you but one more thing I want to say as well while we're talking about this too is that like the other idea of like all of these kinds of different practices being like pseudoscience and like you know alternative medicines and this kind of thing that also makes me insane because like you've just described with Kimbana and very like like you said you just laid out kind of a skeleton but there is so much like history and thought and detail and there's like like you said there's kingdoms there's legions there's like that's what pisses me off I'm always like even if you don't believe this or understand it do you really think thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people just got caught up in the delusion, the collective delusion, and just kept adding to this for hundreds of years because they were just like too stupid to know anything better? Like, like that, that, that's what really blows my mind, the amount of human thought and systemization and effort and intuition collectively that goes into something rather than someone to just write it off as, oh, that's a, that's insane. Yeah, because your science that's like very, very short, like very, very new, can't prove it. Then all of a sudden, like they do this like Ayurveda and Chinese medicine, things that are like thousands of years old. And they're like, well, that's just pseudoscience because their very new science doesn't understand it or can't prove it. <laughs> And all of this also comes back to, frankly, the, the live progress as well, because that's, I think, where a lot of the, the bedrock of the new science, what, you know, rests on, well, <coughs> because the past is, was, was, was bad, and we didn't know whatever we are coming up with now must be the truth, and that is a bedrock problem. I remember I was taking a class at NYU on, um, I believe this was race and speculation. I remember we watched a cartoon and it was a car, uh, it was like a car uh, maker cartoon, car dealership. I don't know what technology is. I don't watch things. But um, it was just like so overtly fucked up because it was really like an African, like a tall African tribeswoman like, like running across like the safari and then the car driving past her. And her breasts, in the, like like the grotesque, like like, but it was just such a perspective, like such a like a we we implant that shit like well we're better now. They didn't. How do you think you're cured? Do you really think like oh every time your ancestor was sick, like oh I don't know I'm sick, and then we just died, or we just happened to maybe find the right like this is this is insane, guys. This is insane. And again, it just speaks to an extreme abstraction abstraction of, of between ourselves and the non-physical reality, between ourselves and our ancestors in the past, between ourselves and our the earth, and an abstraction between ourselves and ourselves that just doesn't make any goddamn sense. And I say, it's a fucking off earth agenda. Yeah, absolutely. And the, I would say that as well too, that it's, um, it's definitely like all, made to disempower individuals because people do have so much power inherent and like mm -hmm. everything we've been taught is just like is made to disempower individuals it's it's and so therefore it's like so where is that power going 
what what is not getting its needs met because the earth, if we're a part of the earth and the earth is a part of something bigger, what's not getting its needs, needs met that this has to happen? These are the kinds of questions that I'm exploring and that's kind of part of the reason why I'm also bringing a cool down to some of you know my my one-on-one -on -one work so that i can get back to writing and and you know thinking and, and fucking because that's that's important dancing and being beautiful dance oh my god i can't wait to get back to some of the i i, I have like i have like secret dance traditions that i like was studying about years ago in, in new york that like over the a few close people know, but next time that you have like a conference, like maybe in like three years or something, like I'm gonna put on like this, I wanna get on the table and it's gonna be like, oh shit, Kai's about to fucking do it. What is, and it's gonna be a mess, it's gonna be a mess, it's beautiful. So I have some I have surprises for you. We will have so much fun. I'm so excited. Yeah. Thank you for listening to Rendering Unconscious. You've just heard a discussion with Chiron Armand. For more, please check out his books, Deliverance, Hoodoo Spells of Uncrossing, Healing and Protection, and Clearing Spaces, Inspirational Techniques to Heal Your Home, and visit his websites. Links to everything can be found in the text accompanying this episode. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry. Available from Trapart Books, 2019. Please visit our publisher's website, www.trapart.net. You can support the podcast by visiting our Patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash v-a-n-e-s-s-a two three c-a-r-l. Your support is greatly appreciated.
become stronger as we ascend into endless abstractions. These, however, are easily shattered. In front of the front, we anxiously seek civilized expressions. Behind the behind, we simply communicate.